Okay, so it's not about one's ability to participate, not really. It's actually they're human. So humans are just special because we're human. Another Earthling Ed video. I keep getting requests to look at more of his stuff, his debates and whatnot. So I thought I would, specifically this recent one where he's talking to a libertarian. I thought that was a good one for me to touch on, given that I used to self-identify as a libertarian. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of libertarian he is, if he's more of a pragmatic, I'm libertarian because I believe that this is the best political system, the system with the best outcomes, or if it's more philosophically driven or dogmatically driven. So if he's more of like an objectivist type libertarian. I'm guessing it's going to be that because typically those type of libertarians are going to be the ones who are most against veganism and going by the title, he is not a <laughs> not a fan. So I'm guessing it's going to be more ideologically motivated in the sense that he believes it is wrong to force people to do certain things, most things, outside of like a court system and a police force and protection from other countries, from attacks. That's it. Like that's the extent of government involvement. In my experience, pragmatic libertarians who don't have all of that baggage attached, the kind of Ayn Rand-esque stuff attached are more useful, <laughs> it's a terrible way to word that, are actually worth listening to because they care more about policy and they care more about outcomes. If you're just dogmatically driven by this principle that you believe to always be true no matter what, you really can't care about pragmatism. You really can't care about how these policies work in practice. Taxation is always wrong, period, that sort of thing. I just wanted to start with that because I'm sure I'm going to be against a lot of the things that he has to say, and I don't want it to come across like I think libertarianism is just totally useless and, and not worth listening to. I think, again, when you're talking about more pragmatic libertarianism, there's a tendency to really think about unintended consequences, which is very, very good. On the left, I think there is often a tendency to let's just give people things and that's always the best answer, period, whereas often libertarians will say, well, wait a minute sometimes there are consequences to that that we really don't want and sometimes it really is better for the market to be the ultimate decider and not the government. Like housing, for instance, the biggest issue with housing is that there isn't enough of it. And a large issue, particularly out here in the West, is zoning, having areas that only allow single family homes. This is largely not an issue of government intervention. If anything, it's the opposite. We want less government intervention and we want people to be allowed to build lots of housing, lots of multifamily housing. Anyway, I need to shut up because this is a 30 minute video and I'm sure I'm going to be talking for way too long anyway. Okay. Hi, Jed. My name is Ed and uh, nice little rhyme. And it's lovely to meet you. Uh, thank you so much for sitting down and uh, having a conversation with me. As Thanks. you know, I think I'd be welcome. As you know, I have a banner and it says, why aren't you vegan yet? Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, what are your thoughts about that question? So as a libertarian, I believe that um, people should have the freedom to do with their uh, life, body, and lifestyle as they wish. And I believe that um, I very much respect the fact that you're vegan, and I hope that there are businesses which uh, cater to you, and that if there aren't everywhere, uh, given how big um, the vegan culture is now, they're really missing out and they should hop in on it. Yeah. But I also believe that we should, um, those of us who do not uh, care to be uh, vegan, yeah. I think those of us who do like meat, since after all we are made with both kinds of teeth as humans, we do have both uh, the carnivorous and the herbivorous teeth. There's a lot going on here. So number one, you heard him talk about the market basically. So very classic uh, libertarian, laissez-faire government. They don't want any sort of force involved. They want people to have the option to create these products for vegans. And in a large sense, they are right. I talked about in a very recent video that a lot of what has happened in terms of the vegan movement becoming more influential has happened just because of individuals and it has happened because of individual companies responding to demand and creating products. There has been very little to no government intervention. There's been a little bit in terms of cage-free eggs and things like that, but in terms of actually getting people excited about veganism and eating more vegan foods, it's been like all market-driven. 
Now that is changing, which I would say is a very good thing. I think it was Tufts University has started their cellular agriculture program and they have received a grant from the USDA and some other countries as well have actually invested in plant-based alternatives and clean meat. But again, I, I think Jed, I believe his name is, I, I think he would be against that sort of thing as a libertarian. Again, government should be very, very, very limited. And if we care about those things as individuals, cellular agriculture, whatever, then we need to finance it ourselves. We should not be forcing other people to do it. And taxation is force. And then he got into the both kinds of teeth thing as an argument why meat eaters should be allowed, I guess, to still eat meat. Those of us who do like meat, since after all, we are made with both kinds of teeth as humans, we do have both uh, the carnivorous and the herbivorous teeth. Yep. I believe that um, there should be no cultural pressure for us to be vegan. So that's really interesting. He's not talking about force, which I appreciate. Often these conversations, that's the way they go. They talk about, well, you're trying to force me to be vegan, and then we have to go, no, we're trying to influence people. This is really annoying. But no, he's talking about just cultural pressure. So people like me and Earthling Ed should not be saying that, hey, it's uh, morally wrong to eat meat when you don't have to. Please stop eating meat. Because teeth? I assume there's going to be more of an argument there. Um, I think the teeth thing just popped into his brain. And so he said it. What kind of teeth we have has no bearing on the morality of a practice unless it means that like we literally could not eat plants, right? If we literally could not process plants, there was just no way and we had to eat meat to survive because of our teeth. Okay, fine. But clearly we do a, a pretty good job with plant food. Many herbivorous animals also have canine teeth. I'm not saying we're herbivores, biologically speaking, but just because we have canines doesn't provide us with a moral justification to, to harm animals. You know, we can do a multitude of things, but just because we have the capacity to do those things doesn't provide us with the justification to do so. Very well said. Much better said than what I said. <laughs> I believe that if we enjoy eating meat from ultimately different species, lower species, if they weren't lower species, then why haven't they destroyed us yet? So basically, he's making a, a might is right argument, which is not at all libertarian, just to be clear. The point of government is to protect the little guy, quote unquote, from the big guy, whether it's physical harm or stealing, protect private property. They're lower species. They're, I, I guess there's going to be an intelligence argument there. Uh, they're not as good as us. And so we can do whatever we want, or at the very least, we can eat them. Well, cows and pigs and chickens and turkeys. I don't know how he would feel about cats and dogs. Presumably as a libertarian, you can eat them. You can do whatever you want with them. The first point you made about being a libertarian was about kind of like, you know, individual sovereignty um, and the right to your own kind of like life and existence. Um, but what about the animals? Why do why does our right to our own sovereignty and our own individuality and our own body, uh, how does it morally justify it to come at the expense of someone else? So um, as a libertarian, ultimately, I believe that uh, our government, I like the libertarian form of government and ultimately it is the government uh, government is a contract between individuals and a sovereign state so that uh, we do not all murder each other and we live in some sort of order yeah. and um animals are not included in this they not, not currently of course well um they would not be able to participate in um they, they would not be able to actively participate in any formation of a government so this is where knowing the argument for marginal cases really comes in handy. Obviously, many people cannot fully participate. There are severely intellectually disabled people. There are people who are essentially in comas, but they're still alive. Can we just do whatever we want with them? Clearly, they cannot actively participate in any form of a government. I mean, there, there are people with less uh, intellectual capability than some animals. If that's what you're going by, then it seems like certain animals would have uh, a better standing in terms of rights than certain humans. Doubt he's going to say that. I, I think Earthling Ed is going to respond with that. And uh, just watch the video, you dummy. Shut up. When we're talking about social contracts, humans with a lack of certain cognitive abilities, they also can't engage in the social contracts that we're discussing. Are their lives less morally valuable because they can't engage in the same social contracts that you and I can? Well, ultimately, they will eventually be able to, but also... Not someone, not someone who's uh, cognitively impaired in the ways that we're discussing right now. Perhaps not, but they are also human. Okay, so it's not about one's ability to participate, not really. It's actually they're human. So humans are just special because we're human.
Not particularly convincing to me, but okay. <laughs> I care far more about one's ability to suffer than whether or not they're human. And you know what? I would love to ask him or, or anyone, I mean, a lot of people say this, right? And ultimately they end up going back on, well, they're not human. <laughs> um, I would love to ask, okay, wh what if uh, an alien species comes down to earth and they're very friendly and they're super intelligent. They're intelligent enough to actively participate in our government and our culture, all of that stuff. But hey, they're not human. What about when AI becomes sentient, which is it's very likely going to happen. I mean, is he, I guess we know whose side he's on in the, in the Westworld scenario, huh? <laughs> Just do whatever you want with them because they're not human. I don't think human is a particularly good metric when it comes to uh, value, when it comes to moral value. I think suffering sentience is. And ultimately, different species have different social constructs. Uh, for example, how about um, if we're going to talk about animals in general, what about the wolves? Should we chastise them? Should we reprimand them for uh, feeding on um, species which are lower down the food chain? I mean, clearly not. They don't have the same capacity as we do. <laughs> it's very interesting. He clearly believes that we are far above other species and that we can do whatever we want to other species because of the things they lack. So you think he would be able to answer that himself. No, clearly we don't chastise the wolf. The wolf does not understand morality. The wolf has no ethical system. That said, I don't think that, oh gosh, should I even get into that? I believe wild suffering is a terrible thing. Um, I hate that we revel in these nature documentaries where it's the lion chasing the antelope and, and all of that. And it's just, oh, it's, it's brutal, but it's nature, so it's fine. No, man, it sucks. <laughs> if there's a way we can put it into that, that is great because suffering is suffering, period. Obviously, I'm much more focused on the, the food we eat and the suffering that we directly cause, but we could certainly play a hand in reducing wild animal suffering. Anyway, if you're interested in that topic, there's a lot of good reading. I'll put references in the description. Animals in the wild who, who kill other animals do so out of necessity. They do so to survive. Uh, we don't have that excuse. And also, uh, we have moral agency. You know, on the one hand, we're referring to ourselves as higher beings. You know, they're lower beings. But on the other hand, we're trying to use what they do to justify our morality. It can't be both things. Again, much better said than what I said. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> That's what I had said if I had taken 30 minutes to write notes and meticulously reword all my stuff, but you can just do that on the fly. You guys are always like, debate people. It's like, I'm not good at that. I don't speak good at on my own in like this. Because we have moral agency, we're able to rationalize our choices and we're able to understand the positives and negatives of those choices. And because we live in a society where we have the choice to do something else, that's something else reducing suffering, then morally speaking, to me, that's the preferable choice to make. What do you think about that? Asking questions. I said this in the other debate that I looked at, Earthling Ed debate about the indigenous cultures and, and meat eating. He's always asking questions, which is really good. And he, you know, comes across as someone who is really listening and really wants to listen to the other person, which I think is pretty rare, especially with any sort of video titled debate, you know? <laughs> from like a YouTuber, not like a more formal debate, although some formal debates can get pretty nasty. I guess first I would ask you, what is human morality? What is human moral agency? Uh, well, morality in its in its purest philosophical terms is of course subjective. I don't, I don't have a spiritual or religious belief that creates a definition of what is moral or immoral. So interesting, he thinks the only way you can have objective morality is if you believe that there is a a goddess, or essentially it has to be of a religious nature, it has to be of a dogmatic nature, basically. I don't agree with that at all. I believe I have a whole video, maybe I have two actually, questioning subjective morality. And, and ultimately I believe that there is objective morality. We may not always know what that is when we are making choices. We may not always have the full uh, context, but I think in every single case, there is the most moral option, whether we know it or not. Kind of like chlorophyll exists whether we know what it is or not, right? There are lots of things in nature that we don't really understand. It doesn't mean it's magic. But I think that we can by and large try and understand morality as being something that is seeking to reduce harm and suffering, something that's working to create a society that is more quote unquote utopian, even though that word is of course, uh, you know, impractical because it will never exist. It's about pursuing um, goals and aspirations that make life better for as many people and as many beings as possible. So reducing suffering basically. So altruism, altruism. Um, I mean, I guess you could go down the route of altruism, yes. Uh-oh, altruism to a libertarian. Ooh, it's like the dirtiest word. <laughs>
<laughs> altruism, collectivism, oh no. Okay, I need to listen to what he said again because it sounded like essentially he does believe there's objective morality, but he doesn't want to say there's objective morality. But I think that we can by and large try and understand morality as being something that is seeking to reduce harm and suffering. Morality is about reducing suffering, but maybe uh, practically, I'm not sure what he's saying. <laughs> I think people say subjective morality without really understanding what that means, because truly subjective morality means that I get to decide what's moral, you get to decide what's moral. It's like, I like vanilla ice cream, you like chocolate ice cream. I like killing puppies, you don't, but it's not wrong. I think it's fine. Now, anyone who says there's subjective morality never agrees with that ever, right? It's like people who say that all beings are totally equal. No one actually behaves in that way as if we are all totally equal. Typically, you see the subjective morality more in terms of not criticizing other cultures. It was very frustrating taking cultural anthropology classes in college because, man, there was a lot of that. I slightly understand, right? People know uh, different things and often upbringing can significantly influence, obviously, the way people think. So I don't think just having a, oh, they do this, wow, they're gross, horrible people. I mean, that's just really childish. But on the other hand, we can still say that an action is good or bad without condemning the person doing the action. Point is, yes, I believe there's objective morality. And if you don't believe that, I think you get into a lot of trouble trying to discuss morality, trying to discuss topics like veganism, because who are you going to convince? <laughs> I mean, if it's all subjective, what's even the point? But again, I, I don't think that's really what he believes. I, I think it sounds like he's trying to say it's hard maybe to always know what is maybe the best choice, kind of what I said before. I don't know. I'm confused. <laughs> One question that I would ask is if it came down to reducing the suffering or the hunger of human beings and the, um, I guess, the death of animals, uh, which would you choose? I'm not sure what the point of that question is. I mean, I, I guess I understand the point, but um, Ed has already said that it's, it's an issue of uh, necessity and clearly we don't have that. We can choose to not eat animal products. We're not talking about choosing between starving or eating animals. In times of necessity, you can morally justify something. So if a human is starving and requires, um, you know, needs to kill a chicken to survive, then of course the human could justify that. But that's not the situation we're in. You know, in a situ an extreme situation, you could find reasons to save one life over the other. Case in point, let's say a, a building is on fire and inside the building you have a five-year-old child and a 95-year-old human. You could justify saving the five-year-old child over the 95-year-old human because the child has their life ahead of them, you know, all these different, different factors, but that doesn't justify needlessly harming the elderly in a normal society. Same with the animals. We don't have the choice between a chicken and a human. If we did, you could definitely choose the human over the chicken, but our choice is human, chicken, or neither. And because we have the neither choice, that is the morally preferable choice to make. But uh, one thing that I want to return to is you mentioned that um, there shouldn't be a hierarchy of beings. I, mean, but, I didn't say that. Or, okay, so you do say that um, in a time between choosing a chicken and a human, you would choose the human. In, a, in a, a situation of necessity, where I had no choice but to choose one or the other, you could find justifications for why the human life would be wor worth saving over the chicken's life. So if I were Jed, is that his name, Jed? Um, I would have kind of pushed back. I, I mean, I would have asked questions, said, well, why? Why exactly would it be better uh, to save the human over the chicken? While I agree you would save the human over the chicken, uh, not in every case. <laughs> Certainly if there was some like serial murder or something, you know, hopefully you would save the chicken. But even if not, even if we just have like a, an average human and an average chicken, uh, I would say, yeah, save the human. And I think that can get difficult to I explain. So yeah, I kind of wish that Jed had asked Ed that. I would like to hear how Ed would respond to that. Because there are arguments, like real arguments, even uh, Peter Singer has kind of discussed this, that uh, in some ways it's possible for lower animals, for non-human animals to be more morally valuable in the sense that how they experience suffering could actually be worse. I think he used the example of a dog being put into uh, a car captured and like to take to the pound or even just to go to the vet or, or whatever and they have no idea what's going on they're terrified no one can explain to them and say hey hey no it's cool we're taking you to the vet to get a checkup it's all right and the dog's like oh cool no problem no they're just like car what the hell <laughs> or i guess a better example would be cats if you've ever had cats in a car often it's uh 
oh man, they are just terrified. I had two cats that would just drool and breathe really heavy. It was, it was awful for them and you couldn't do anything. You couldn't explain to them that like, hey kitty, it's all right. Point is, um, I would have loved to see that, but it didn't happen. So moving on. What do you think? When we have the choice between human chicken or Neva, what is the morally obligated choice to make? I believe and respect that um, I believe that anyone uh, should have the capacity to choose uh, what they believe their obligation is so long as they do not actively infringe on the rights of another human being in our society. Can I, let's take, let's, let's remove farm animals, let's go for any animal. Could I kick a dog, stomp a dog to death? Could I poach an elephant? Could I hunt a whale? Can I do anything to any other animal based on the fact that I am a human and as a libertarian yourself, that's the only thing that has a sovereign value when it comes to species? Has our society outlawed, outlawed these things? Are we living in a society that has outlawed... Um, Does legality okay. equal morality? <laughs> in my view, I do not believe that there is an intrinsic morality. Okay, so he's definitely not objectivist. Objectivists do not believe that morality doesn't exist. They believe in objective morality, uh, just that it's very different from like what I believe to be objective morality, <laughs> that you don't force people in like most scenarios, again, because it's wrong, period. Very interesting to hear him bring up uh, law and whether or not actions have been outlawed. Typically, libertarians don't base decisions on whether or not something is legal. Many libertarians think that a lot of regulations should be abandoned, even, you know, laws uh, protecting certain rights, anti-discrimination laws, anything like that. Again, they want government as simple as possible. If I want to hire only white women with double G boobies, I should be allowed to do that. I should be able to put on my application, only apply if you are a white lady with triple, what did I say? Double G boobies. <laughs> I should be allowed to do that. That should not be uh, in the realm of governmental intervention. So yeah, really interesting to hear a libertarian say, well, is it legal? <laughs> so just because something is legal doesn't mean that it's wrong or right. I believe that ultimately a government comes together and they inform society of their laws, which are essentially the moral values and the moral codes to abide by so as to but make the change, right? society. Law, laws change as do morals within society. Exactly because it is a top-down movement. Yeah. So if that was the first thing I heard from him, I would never guess he were libertarian. I would guess that he was like a, a cultural relativist against subjective morality and every government is morally equal. Um, that's, that's the way it sounds to me, but he describes himself as a libertarian, which means that he believes in a laissez-faire government as the best form of government. So clearly he does not believe that whatever a government says goes. I mean, that's just like dictatorship, <laughs> pro-authoritarianism. Interesting. I'm not trying to d denigrate him, but I think he's really confused on libertarian principles. And um, again, I don't want this to come across as just like libertarians don't know anything. No, that's not true. There, there are people who are very well versed in um, this way of thinking. And again, really interested in policies and policy outcomes. Um, I think he's a young guy who maybe just learned about libertarianism and <laughs> is a little bit confused. <laughs> happens to the best of us, right? So we challenge things regardless of the legality of those things. So just because, you know, killing a pig is legal, but uh, hunting, you know, poaching an elephant is illegal, doesn't mean that killing a pig is moral and poaching an elephant is immoral. Because morality and legality, whilst they should be the same, of course, we would think that they should be, in actuality, they're not. Well, I would say that different people can have different opinions of it, and ultimately what matters in um, the only thing that objectively matters is what the law is. Well, so what's your opinion then? Let's say a dog's walking past now, can I stomp that dog to death if I want to? Uh, is it outlawed here? What is the law here? It's not. Let's say, let's say it's not outlawed. Let's say for a hypothetical situation, currently where we are, it's not outlawed for me to stomp that dog to death. What is your personal opinion on the morality of me doing so? I do not operate with um, the idea of a morality, so you c I personally wouldn't. I don't feel the need to, but if you did, um, okay. I appreciate him saying that because I, I was going to say it seems like maybe the whole is it legal or not is a way to get out of saying that, yeah, you should be allowed to stomp the dog to death. But he finally does admit that, yeah, he, he didn't get off on it. It's not really his thing, but if you want to do that, go ahead. Which is, you know, um, I, not a particularly uh, compassionate position in my opinion, but I appreciate the honesty. 
And I'm going to stop there for now. Otherwise, this video would be 50 minutes long. So this is the end of part one. I hope you enjoyed it. Stay tuned for part two, which has some more um, interesting takes from Jed the Libertarian. Not, not really Libertarian.